share tonight. And I found in a file that I keep things that I haven't used. Uh, Jeremy Thompson's Lunar Object Lesson. And uh, he did a, a fine job on this. He was still in school at the time, I believe, but uh, shared it with me. There's several things that he, that I share of his, um, often quotes and discoveries he made and things he researched, <clears throat> and uh, I've appreciated his help in that regard through these years. The Lunar Object Lesson by Jeremy Thompson. <clears throat> and uh, I think you'll find this to be um, just a nice way of, of thinking about it. It's not a Bible lesson exactly, although we're looking at the Bible uh, in these things. But we're taking what God made and how God said, what God said about it as an object lesson. So an object lesson, I could hold a candle up here and say uh, the... the flame reminds us of this, and the wax uh, feeding up the flame reminds us of that, this and that, and so on, and we just could have an object lesson. So we begin with Genesis 1, 16 to 18, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. So he says, in the account of creation, God tells us that he created a greater light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night. The greater light was the sun, the lesser light was the moon. These were created to give light to the world. So we're looking at the sun, the moon, and the world here uh, in this object lesson. In this object lesson, let us consider the relationship between the sun and the moon and compare it to the relationship between the sun and the and the Christian, the S-O-N sun, and the Christian. The S-U-N sun is the greater light that rules the day. It produces its own light and is the primary source of light for the world. Without the light and heat from the sun, plants and animals alike would die. John 1, 1 5, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. Here we see uh, an echo of what he was just said about the sun. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. We see Colossians 1.17, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. While the sun is necessary for physical life, Christ is necessary for both physical and spiritual life. Ephesians 2, 1, And you hath he quickened, you has he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Christ is the source of true life for the world. Without Christ, the world is dead in sin. While Christ was on this earth, he was the only source of light and life for the sin-filled world. John 8, 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 9, 4, and 5, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Well, when Christ ascended into heaven, it was like the sun setting, the sun leaving us. We were left with the night. However, the night has the light as well. The lesser light of creation is the moon. Now, the moon does not produce light on its own. The light from the moon is only a reflection of the sun's light. Matthew 5, 14 and 15, Jesus is speaking here, the one who said he was the light of the world. He says, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. No. <laughs> the lesser, uh, excuse me, uh, under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. So in Matthew, Christ declared Christians to be the light of the world. But they are the, like the moon. They cannot produce their own light. But we reflect the light of the Son of God. <clears throat> 
So the moon, however, does not always show its light. There are things we call phases. During the phases of the moon, the sun's light is not always reflected back to the earth. In each of the moon's phases, the light of the sun shines fully on the moon. The sun and the moon are out there on their own, and uh, the sun is shining on that moon. It just depends on where you are on earth and where the earth is in relation to the uh, sun and the moon. So there is a thing called the full moon. Now the full moon occurs when all of the reflected sunlight, the reflected sunlight from the moon shines on the earth. So you have to have the sun and the moon and then the earth about here where the sun's shining on the moon, but we see the full face of that where we are on earth. This is like a Christian who reflects the word of God in his attitudes, in his actions, a full moon Christian. How about that? Put that on your t-shirt. I'm a full moon Christian. Is fully reflecting the light of the Son of God on a dark and sinful world. The earth doesn't only not produce its own light as a planet, but um, doesn't even reflect well. So um, the moon shines to us in the dark. Now there's a thing called the gibbous moon. A gibbous moon is almost full, but there's a small area where the sun's rays are not reflected back at the world. And so in this case, the, the world is here, the sun and the moon are off to the side. So while it's shining full on it there, we're at a place where we see part of the dark side. <clears throat> uh, is there anyone that you know that might not be able to say, I saw Jesus in you? Do you know somebody who would say, I'm not, I'm not sure if they're a Christian or not? Does everyone know that you are a Christian? Do your co-workers know? Do all of your relatives know? Are you sharing that testimony fully? Or partially to these people, maybe that your light is hidden? There's a thing called the half moon. The half moon has an even greater area that is hidden from the world. Maybe you only witness on visitation time. Maybe you only witness when that subject is up and you kind of get drawn into it. Maybe you only reflect a Christ-like spirit on certain days. Then again, there's the crescent moon where it's almost all dark. The crescent moon barely reflects any of the light back to earth. This is the Christian that barely ever shows the light to others. Again, there's a thing called the new moon. And that's where it doesn't reflect any light at all. It just, if you're looking carefully in a clear night, you can see it's there. But um, it's not reflecting any light. So this is the closet Christian. Not, not the Christian who just goes to the closet to pray. He's the one that has not revealed himself to be a Christian. Does, what do people say at school that when you tell them you become a Christian? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Well, don't be that way. They sit in the church. They read their Bibles, but they're too afraid to witness to others. We don't want to be the new moon kind of Christian. We want to be more and more the full moon. Then he deals with this concept of the eclipses, two kinds of eclipse. One is the lunar eclipse where the moon can't be seen. So from time to time, the moon or a portion of it enters the earth's shadow. So in this case, you actually line up the sun, the earth, and the moon. And in this case, all the shadow of the earth hides the moon. There's no light from the sun shining on it as it does in all the different phases. This is called the lunar eclipse. The moon is dimmed partially or almost completely, depending on how much of the Earth's shadow blocks the sun's light. What's going on here in our object lesson? When a Christian allows the world to come between him and the Son of God, the Christian cannot reflect the light. 
he looks more like the world in its darkness. Maybe the Christian is in partial eclipse. If you have one area that you've not surrendered to God, that area is in darkness. Maybe it is someone you've not forgiven. Mark eleven twenty five. When you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So remember that God has forgiven you for much more and greater sins than what any one person has done to you. He's already forgiven you. Why can you not find it in yourself to forgive them? Maybe it's an area of the tongue. Gossip and criticism, all too easy for the Christian to fall into. Um, you know, just sharing something bad with people. James talk, talks about this, James chapter 3, verses 2, 5 through 8. For in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. He says, normally we offend, we offend in word. And able also to bridle the whole body. If you can bridle the tongue, you can, you can bridle everything about yourself. 5 through 8. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Ask the people out there in the dry California forests. Uh, just a little fire cause a great, great fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members. It defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. This is the word Gehenna. This is the lake of fire. <clears throat> this is where the burning punishment of the, of the lost in hell, fire, reaches up and touches us early through the, the wickedness of the tongue. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. So we may bridle it. You know what bridling is, is, is that thing they put in the horse's mouth. And um, so you can painfully hold yourself in, but you're always going to have to be fighting with the wildness of your tongue. There's something about that that's ready to hurt somebody with your language. What sinful worldly attitude or philosophy have you allowed between you and the Lord? It is only blocking the light in a single, is it only blocking the light in a single area? Or has it completely destroyed your testimony and blocked you off from the light? Well, the other kind of eclipse is the solar eclipse. And this is when the moon gets between the world and the sun. Uh, interesting, the sun is so much bigger than the moon, but in the comparative distances, the moon is exactly the size of the sun, so that when it gets right there, you can't see the sun, but you can see the, the fire coming off of it, the corona, they call it, the crown, not the coronavirus. A solar eclipse occurs when the moon blocks the sun's light. Christians, being the moon, can block the light of the Son of God when we allow selfish sin nature to come to the front. The world looking for Christ in us sees us, but we block Christ out. People look at us when we are in a selfish, self-centered mood, when we allow our pride to lead us to anger at small slights, some sort of road rage, someone cut us off in the grocery store, or some other petty anger. People do not see Christ in us. Well, that's not the way God intended it. Philippians 2, 3 to 8, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Um, the, James tells us, the wrath of man, your anger, worketh not the righteousness of God. 
See, be angry and sin not, he tells them in, in Ephesians. But that's not you being angry at people. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You can't work God's righteousness when you're showing anger. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. What does esteem mean? You say, well, nobody's better than me. I'm not better than anybody else. No, that's not what he's saying. You act as though they're better than you. That's the humble part of it. You're not saying they're better than you. That may, may be quite the opposite of the truth. But you treat them as though they're better. That's how you esteem them. He says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was equal with God. But, even though he, that's true, he made himself of no reputation, he emptied himself, and took upon him the form of a servant. He was in the form of God, he took on the form of a servant. He became a true servant, a slave. And was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. God of all humbled himself to die. So maybe we are allowing ourselves to be selfish when it comes to possessions. Mine, mine, mine. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. The story about the moth is that he doesn't attack the clothes you're wearing, he attacks the clothes you have stored away. So you have, in this sense, almost more than you need. And then the moth will come in and lay the eggs and eat it up. Rust happens not while you're using the thing, but when it's stored away. And thieves break through and steal, usually not for my collection of cardboard boxes, but for something expensive, something that was extravagant. And they steal that. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, what do you treasure? The stuff, or God, and serving people. For your treasure is, there will your heart be also. When we allow our selfish sin nature to block the light of, God, of the Son of God, we blind those around us to his glory. They say, look, there's a Christian doing that. They're all alike. When a sinful lost person sees a selfish Christian, they can be turned away from God. This is when they can say that all those Christians are hypocrites. Instead of being an eclipsed or an eclipsing Christian, even a new crescent half or gibbous Christian, we should all want to be the full moon Christian. Is anything between you and God today, tonight? Clear it out of the way so that you can see the light. Are you standing between the sun and a lost person? Move aside your selfish nature. Let the light of the Lord shine on the lost. Are you afraid to witness in some area of your life? Surrender meekly to God. Let his light reflect to all those around you. Isn't that a good object lesson? For a college student thinking that through?